I am with CPI Telecom, and that is my contact info if you guys have any questions or want to follow up. And I'm going to talk about SD-WAN. Who's heard of SD-WAN? Feel like you know it well, kind of well? Conceptually. What do you know about it? What do you... Um, it is disruptive. Yes, I would agree. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing this. Yeah, absolutely. Competitiveness. Absolutely. So we'll talk about SD-WAN. Part of SD-anything is the decoupling of hardware and software. So we're allowing more and more that things that we used to buy the hardware for to run with our own hardware. And a little x86 box like this or a VM running on a box or a Hyper-V someplace. So there's a lot of effort, if you've heard of uh, virtual network, uh, DNF, uh, the, the functions of a virtual network, uh, NFV, network function virtualization. It's the concept of getting rid of hardware and decoupling it from software. So a lot of the SD-WAN work, a lot of the people that are coming out in this area don't necessarily make, make you buy their hardware. They'll use uh, anybody's hardware. Um, but it's really about reinventing the wide area network. And in most cases, when you have a new technology, you talk about is it innovative? Does it really change the game? Is it disruptive? Does it make a big splash in the industry? And so we'll talk about SD-WAN, because there is a lot of hype about it, and I think a lot of misconception about what the uh, impacts are of it to the industry and why. So let's start with, what is a WAN? Who's been doing wide area networking here for at least five years? 10? 15? 20? So have you guys heard of X25? Yeah? So when I started in networking, and I'm going to date myself a little bit, we had, we didn't have wide area networking, we had local area networking, and it was 10 base 5 thick net, if you've ever heard of that. Vampire taps, you could tow your car out of a ditch with it, it was pretty big cable. Um, we had point-to-point -point for Amelia TM early, but for, even before we invented the wide area network, we had the local area networks. Do you know why the wide area network started? The founders of Cisco? Yeah, it was a husband and wife team at Stanford, and they were in completely different buildings, and they wanted to share emails. They had email systems locally within the building, but they didn't have them between the building, and that started the wide area network. And then from there, it blossomed into these technologies, X25, point-to-point -point frame relay ATM, and so on. The th thing about these technologies was it, was it was really expensive. It was fairly proprietary to a specific carrier. It was slow to deploy. They didn't have a lot of bandwidth, um, no resiliency, really. And if you had a dozen sites and you were looking at those dozen sites, if you had seven, eight of them in the same region and a couple of them that were out of region, the carrier that had that region usually won. So they could charge basically whatever they wanted to charge because they had a unique situation. They had the last mile. They were, it wasn't overly competitive. Um, so this is kind of the history of wide area networking. But when you look back and you say what has been so disruptive in this industry, um, it started out this way with the, the big expense, the complexity. And then we laid on top of it internet. So in the 90s, a lot of people, I don't know when you guys started putting in internet connections. For most of us, it was the late 80s, early 90s. People bought internet connections to connect and get you know, drive specs or whatever lookup info prior to eBay, prior to Google. We had the internet explosion because we needed it for network information connectivity. Email was a big one, a driver just like the founding of Cisco. And so people were buying an internet connection and a wider network connection. And so fairly expensive, but internet was a little more competitive. There were ISPs popping up everywhere. We'd see an ISP jump up to, in just about every town, you get two or three of them almost overnight, and they were delivering via T1s and circuits like that. Um, I came from a business where we got internet because the owner of the business had friends who wanted to email him dirty jokes. He walked in one day and he's like, what's this internet thing? And I said, well, it's a you know, connection to a public network. It's a network of networks, and you can, uh, use it for looking up data, you can use it for emailing. He's like, I have all these friends, they want to send me emails. I don't have email or internet, could you please get me one of those? And we put our internet connection in. So it wasn't very long after that that people said, I don't want to buy both. I'd rather just use my internet connection as my wider network connection. Because I have an internet connection in St. Louis and one here in Omaha, and can I connect them together? And they invented the VPN. And that was a really disruptive technology because it allowed you to use the same circuit for internet connectivity and wide area network connectivity. Kind of displacing the X25s, the frame relays, the ATMs of the world. It was a little less expensive. Um, a carrier didn't have, you didn't have to use the same carrier at all of your sites. It could be any internet connection. 
a um, little more competitive, a little faster to deploy. What we struggled with was trying to run voice over that. And originally voice, when we ran voice over frame relay, wasn't packet voice like we know it today. It was voice over circuit emulation, over TDM circuits, DDS circuits. It really wasn't what it has evolved to today. But um, we started to want to packetize it because the internet is nothing but ethernet packets. What would we struggle with? What are the things that impact? What are the impairments to voice over an IP network or any type of a packet network? QoS, latency. Yeah, latency. What, jitter. What's the other one? Packet loss. Loss. So loss, delay, and jitter. And broadcast. Broadcast a lot of times will because the processor in that thing isn't meant to pick up a bunch of packets and do a lot of things. It's kind of a, a low power processor. It doesn't have the ability to look at a ton of broadcast. That's why we break it off of VLANs. So when you look at loss, delay, and jitter, which one of those is the easiest to maintain over the internet? Less than 1% loss, less than 150 milliseconds round trip delay, less than 20 milliseconds of jitter. Which one's the easiest one to pull off over the internet? Delay, you can ping anywhere on the internet in 30, 40 milliseconds, and that's round trip, right? You ping something on the internet, it goes down and back, says 40, 50 milliseconds. I've got 150 millisecond budget in delay to deal with one way. Round trip, that'd be 300 milliseconds. So that was a very relevant, as people started looking at the impacts of voice and how we would adapt to running voice over the internet, that was the one they looked at and said, hey, that actually, and it's going to play nicely into when we start talking about SD-WAN, that was the one that they realized gave them the buffer of the room they needed to run voice. So who's heard of Nyquist, Harry Nyquist? Anybody? Um, Harry was a Bell Labs guy, and he, a lot of people think he was the inventor of voice, as we know it today, digital voice. He had a theorem, and his theorem, he was uh, working on analog to digital conversions. So images, video, audio are in an analog format. They're wave format. And he was set out to digitize them. And part of the problem with analog is it's distance, you know, over a long distance, it's exposed to EMI, RFI, outside interference. Um, who, I guess I'm going to date myself again, I would call my grandma when I was a little kid, and it would take, you know, 10, 15 seconds to set up the phone call, and we would talk, and I would say something, and then I'd wait a good three or four seconds for her to answer me back. And that was because of that delay. So analog is very slow, and it's also prone to noise. If you were back then and made phone calls and you compare them to the way they sound today, it was very clips, pops, a lot of interference. There was a lot of difficulty with an analog signal because as it was going through the ground, and it's copper, there's ground hum, the 60 hertz ground hum from electricity. You'd go over a light fixture, you'd go near a street lamp, and it would create interference. And then we'd hit an amplification point, and all we'd do is amplify that noise. Just made it worse and worse and worse as it stepped along. So, the thought of digitizing all this would allow us to eliminate that because it's not an analog format, it's just a zero or a one. So his theorem states that if you were to take an analog signal of any format and want to digitize it, to accurately reproduce it, you'd have to double the fastest frequency that you're sending. So human voice is 300 to 3400 hertz. That's what we can do as a human, that's what we can talk. You bought a Subwoofer, and you say we do 20, 30, 40 hertz, that low bassy, and then the higher frequencies, we have the ability to produce 300 to 3400 hertz. So that was rounded to 4,000, doubled per Nyquist theorem to 8,000, and that was when they started sampling images, voice, everything, to accurately reproduce it as a digital signal. So this was the beginning of the digitization of voice. Later, Alec Reeves was the actual inventor of voice encoding, T1s and all the stuff that we do today with pulse code modulation, where he would take Nyquist's theorem and sample the voice and digitize it. Later in the 80s, Alan Cohen, who is the person who most people would say is the inventor of voice over IP, he's credited with the actual packetization of voice. And here's what those look like. So this is an analog wave format. I sample it 8,000 times a second with an 8-bit word. 64 kilobits, those of us who've been around know what a 64 kilobit DDS circuit is. That is digitization of voice. So in this, if I had noise, it would start looking like this. In this, it's a zero or a one. It's impervious to outside interference. It's not prone to that. So that was part of the reason we set out to digitize it was to clean it up and make it uh, trans transmitted 
even faster because we could write it under faster circuits. So our 10, 15 second phone calls, taking the setups dropped down to two or three seconds. The delay in talking to people was reduced dramatically. So this was the beginning of digitization of voice. And then we started taking that and sampling it and packetizing it. And this was where we started running voice over IP networks. And they ran well over Frame Relay, they ran well over ATM because we could control them. So back to Nyquist and Cohen and Reeves, nobody suggested to them, what if we couldn't control the network? In a TDM network, you can control it, right? It's yours, it's on or off, you own what goes in, you own what goes out, point to point. Even Frame Relay networks had SLAs. So in those cases, we were running voice over it just fine, but as soon as you put it on the internet, you lose all control. You don't have the ability to control packet loss or delay. You don't have a carrier to hold accountable. The internet's best effort. So as they started doing voice over IP, we ended up with difficulties running it over the internet, where we just started using for VPN, because those codecs are intolerant to loss, delay, and jitter, and the internet is subject to loss, delay, and jitter. So we introduced MPLS circuits. MPLS was sitting right beside our internet connections. We had our internet and we had our MPLS. And the reason we had MPLS was because we could control the loss, delay, and jitter. Interestingly, it was very expensive. It was dependent on a single carrier. It was distance sensitive. The local carrier had the last mile in the advantage. It was slow to deploy and there was no resiliency. It's what we just did like 10 years ago that we solved with VPNs and getting rid of the frame relay and all of those expenses and making it any uh, connection from any internet connection to any other. Looks just like that. So that's what SD-WAN's sole purpose in life is to do, is to come out and allow a VPN to support voice. I can go between sites and I can support voice. So a couple of years ago, everybody's heard of WAN optimization. We started using multiple circuits and shifting from one to the other live between those two circuits. But what they did here is they actually decided to add edge solutions that buffered. So you ever watched a Netflix and you click on the movie, and what happens? The little wheel starts spinning. If you were to ask What's, what you're doing right now, it would say, well, I'm buffering based upon your current internet connection and how fast it's running. I'm buffering the video so that when I play it back, I can play it back fluently to you, right? That's what that's doing. It's filling the memory. It's actually testing the internet connection. You see it do a test. You see the speed. You see the throughput. Assuming nobody comes home and starts downloading a big game, it's actually buffering. So in an SD-WAN solution, we introduce these usually lightweight or completely decoupled hardware edge boxes that will use multiple internet connections. And there's no theory of primary or secondary. They're all primary, other than maybe a metered circuit. You wouldn't want an LTE connection from Verizon like this to be a primary because it's, I'm paying per meg, per gig to send that. But all the rest of them are primary circuits. It actually monitors the throughput on any internet connection, and I'll explain how that works in a second, and it can use any of those connections to send voice, video, data, signaling back and forth across, and it intentionally buffers at the other end the packets that it's going to play back. So as it's getting these packets in, it encapsulates them in a VPN type encapsulation, it sends it to the other side, but it's numbered, it's timed, shipped to the other side over a single circuit, and then the other side holds them and it has a buffer holding them so that what's coming out is consistent playback, just like watching a Netflix. So it might have that it's feeding out right now with that extra delay that I now have been you know, given of 150 milliseconds to deliver based upon Cohen and Reeves and Nyquist's theorem, the ability to play this back a little bit behind and the voice codec works just fine. It doesn't like drops, it doesn't like jitter, but it's fine with delay. There's a ton of room for the delay. So that delay created allows me to have a consistent buffer to play back and to even retransmit packets. So I can say to the other side, here's 71, here's 72. I've got 73 through 78 buffered. The next one I got was a 78 again because I sent it down both paths. I'll discard it. I don't have 79, I've got 80. And I'll ask the other side to send me 79 again. So it can actually retransmit a lost packet. Now we do this in TCP anyway, PCs do this, they're retransmitting all day long if they lose packets, they don't care. 
voice cares. Voice drops, it clips, the call disconnects. In the world of SD-WAN, with that buffer, I can retransmit it, I can send it again and play it back, play it back fluently, and the experience of the end user, they don't notice, other than the delay that's introduced. So if you called somebody, if I called that phone without an SD-WAN box, my audio would be pretty real-time. I'd have a cell call to a landline phone, it would sound great. With an SD-WAN box, there's a good quarter of a second of delay there. But that delay is what's allowing me the ability to play it back fluently. Retransmitting, multipathing, measuring each circuit, using each circuit in an active-active format. So intentional buffers used for consistent playback. Packets are replicated across multiple connections. So as I'm getting these packets, I can start to see some jitter going on. Maybe there's a microburst. And I can signal to the other end, go ahead and start using the other path. Or start using both paths. Or replace a lost packet. So it's allowing me, with multiple connections, to play back fluently and retransmit and remediate. The term they use in the industry a lot is remediate. And that is the ability to fix voice. Something that should be able to do, it can't. Something a PC can do, that's a short tail phone, it doesn't have the ability. It uses a 711 or 729 codec. If they come in out of order, you get a clip and a pop. If you lose too many, it drops the connection. So that buffer is allowing me, the, the, affording me the ability to play back fluently. Packets are reordered just ahead of the playback buffer, so the consistent playback, multiple connections are bonded together. If you think about bonding in a normal multi-internet connection, you can't really bond because you have two different IP addresses, correct? This one has this IP address, this one has this one. So as you originate a session, most firewalls, most WAN optimization boxes will session load balance or thread load balance, some of them, but you can't really bond them together because they're two different source IP addresses. At the end, if you hit speedtest.net concurrently on both of them, it sees two different IPs. In the SD-WAN world, and I'll explain why in a second, we actually can bond them. And then any carrier to any carrier connectivity with immediate failover for link degradation and full remediation. So here's what I call it. When I started looking at this about a year ago and I heard tons of hype on SD-WAN and it's the latest thing and it's going to kill MPLS and started digging into it to say what is it actually doing, it looked a lot like DMVPN. Have you guys used DMVPN? In the olden days, we built VPN tunnels manually. We would pin up a connection, you'd have keys and all sorts of algorithms and hashes that you had to use to make sure each site talked to each other, and you had to decide if you were going to populate a routing table. DMVPN fixed that. You just put in a box, it found this main site, it built an automatic routing table, it shared all the information, it shared keys, it shared everything. It made it fairly plug and play for VPN. And that's what SD-WAN looks like. When I first started doing this, it looks just like DMVPN. But I've added a box at the end, an intelligent box, that can do path, multipathing, path uh, failure and, and workaround and remediation so that I can overcome the limitations of the work of Reeves and Cohen in a yucky, you know, a, a codec that was built really in the 40s and 50s uh, packetized in the 80s that we've never really updated. I mean, we're still living on 50, 60, 70 year old codecs. Um, the only person I know that's done any different is Microsoft. Microsoft has their own codec. They built a codec that's built for intolerance. It's a, a different, completely different codec, but it's unique to them and they don't share it with the world. And then full visibility and control of applications and bandwidth. So that's what it looks like. If you look at the picture, I have a branch site. I have a data center, I have gateways and the internet. So here's what it's doing. This circuit, as you can see, there are times when it's not so good. If, there are, if those times happen, I can actually start using this one or this one or this one. This one is an MPLS circuit. Um, interestingly, as I started putting in SD-WAN solutions, everybody believes MPLS is perfect. It's not. MPLS is riddled with problems. In fact, if you were to really test your SLAs, usually it's not meeting it. Lots of jitter. Very little loss, but lots and lots of jitter. Um, which is predominantly the killer of most of the voice that we go and troubleshoot today. But I can use multiple connections, and I can tell them all of these are active. They're all wire line. I'm not opposed to using them. If I had one that was up here that was connected to an LTE modem, I might tell them that it's a metered circuit, so only use it when you absolutely have to. But as I'm sending packets in, this box receives them. It puts a, a header on it, and that header includes 
all the security stuff, but it also includes timing bits. It also includes sequence numbers. Even in UDP streams, it'll actually put its own sequence number on it, on top of the TCP and UDP header, and it'll send it to the other side. This guy is now creating an intentional buffer before playing it back, holding excess packets, and if a packet shows up, that even a UDP packet that is out of sequence, it says, hey, send them down both, and this one arrives before this one, it'll discard the duplicate, and it'll put the first one in the output buffer and send it. Does that make sense? Do you see what the SD-WAN fix is really doing? And it allows me then, coming out of here, with a little more delay, but what came in actually comes out using multiple paths with the ability to duplicate across or even retransmit. You can even have a single internet connection and buffer and retransmit. You can actually go back and say, I only have one internet. We've got sites with customers where you can't get but a local telephone company's internet connection. You can't get a cable co. You can't get wireless, the self-service is horrible, middle of nowhere Nebraska, middle of nowhere Iowa. You can't get anything but one internet connection reasonably. You can actually retransmit on a single circuit. Part of the benefit here is the cost of internet. I think everybody knows probably the fastest declining value anything is the cost per meg of an internet connection. Um, I got 150 meg internet at home for $49 a month. That's really, really, really good internet and really expensive getting me away from the single carrier theory and using the multiple paths and the buffer to retransmit and fix. This is a bookend, but so is this. So there's cloud gateways in some of the SD-WAN provider solutions that allows you to send in on multiple paths, go here and then leave their internet connection with their IP address, which is how you get around bonding. So I can have two different IP addresses here, go to two different circuits here, come out, hit a 10 gig, 40 gig, 100 gig link, and hit a data center, a carrier service, Office 365, um, any uh, you know, replication of SAN, anything you're trying to do, can be shipped across and bonded across multiple internet connections. Yeah? So if, let's say you have a mission-critical application running on Citrix. Mm -hmm. Session? Absolutely, because you've got to remember that Citrix session is going to come in and they're business policies, so I'll, go do, I'll do a demo. But we can actually name Citrix, just like you can name Microsoft Update. I don't want Microsoft Update to use my LTE connection because it'll cost me a bazillion dollars. Citrix sessions, single path, multi-path, bonded is a configuration. So I just create a rule that says I can hit, now is your Citrix farm here or is it here? I assume it's here. You control it, it's probably your Citrix. Is it somebody else's as a service or is it your own? Either way, if it's yours, we can bond. And this could have multiple internet connections. You can have multiple internet connections. Two $49 internet connections, one from your cable co, one from your telco, bonded together and still have them come out here and speed them up, add the resiliency, add all sorts of stuff, make it a lot faster and a whole lot cheaper which is the promise of SD-WAN. Everybody says, I wish I had VPN that supports voice. It's kind of the holy grail of an internet connection is I could work from home and be a contact center agent. I can talk and play and work from home over the internet and have it be business grade with audio too, with video. Can I answer your question? This, kind of a little bit closer a look, this right here, these are three different connections. This is when it wouldn't have supported voice. And had that been my only connection, I would have had clipping and popping. This is when it would, but I'm getting close. These are warnings, and we'll look at these in a real-time uh, session in just a second. These two line up, and so does this one. So if this were green right here, this would have been perfect, because I would have used all three connections. Sometimes if this one were a little faster, if this one were, had a little more delay in it, this has a ton of delay in it because it's cellular, and this building today is just getting pounded with people on Verizon. That's a Verizon connection, but I get lots of loss and lots of jitter that I wasn't getting last night while we were setting this up. But because of the delay, this portion right here would have still been green. They actually show a bar across the top in the real-time system that says what, what, because of what I was able to do, here's what the experience was, was able to use these three connections and deliver a perfect 10 phone call. Does that make sense? What it's doing makes sense? I see a little bit of nodding. Yeah? yeah? MOS scores. Anybody know what a MOS score is? It's a little bit older, but it's a 
perception of what the call would have been like, means opinion score, had you had a phone call going. So 2% packet loss and Cohen and Reeves's pulse code modulation and packetization, at 2% packet loss, the call sounds horrible. Absolutely horrible. With some buffering and remediation, a 2% packet loss sounds amazing. A 33 millisecond jitter, a MOSA 3.3, a 33 millisecond of jitter with an SD-WAN solution, even on a single link, absolutely improves because the playback is now consistent. These don't have really big playback buffers, jitter, de-jitter buffers. This has a huge de-jitter buffer. That's all it really is, is a great big buffer box. If you look at it, it's a multi-pathing buffer box. And this is what it's all about. I have a customer, 35, 36 sites, their current MPLS bill is $58,000 a month. Do you have anybody calling on that? Um, yes, I do. Thank you, though, Tim. I, <laughs> uh, some of our reps are. Um, the, uh, the job of a telco is to make sure that you can't leave them, right? Really expensive, proprietary circuits. I can charge more for MPLS, supply and demand. I'm the only one that can give you MPLS. And I stagger my contract dates. And the reason I do that is so it's really hard to leave me. My theory is you're not going to leave me because it's an all or once. I mean, you've got to rip them all out. So good luck leaving me going from Verizon to AT&T because the contract dates are staggered. Nobody predicted that we just start picking them off one at a time and have our MPLS cloud and our SD-WAN cloud. But we can do that because you have some contracts expiring. They have some contracts expiring all the time. So we have these contracts. As they start falling off, we start moving them over here and you start seeing the cost drop dramatically. This is why the carriers are so scared. This is when I heard SD-WAN, we're actually a big agent partner of CenturyLink's and a bunch of others, Mediacom and, and the likes. And they came out and they said, oh my goodness, SD-WAN scares the heck out of me. And we're like, why? What, you know, pff, it's another one of those BS whatever. And we started digging into it. We started realizing most of their money is based upon proprietary circuits that could just as easily be internet, but they put a little bit of an SLA over top of it and can charge you whatever they want. They've got a country ca captured audience. Imagine getting rid of that. Imagine getting rid of their unlevel playing field and letting you do it with any connection you get from anybody you can get. I can actually throw one of these out. I just did. I threw one up in an hour this morning at 8.30. I created an SD-WAN site over a cellular modem overnight. Right now getting MPLS installed for us, eight, nine, ten months. Anybody heard of GPON and just cringe when you say the term? It is horrible to get things installed anymore. This can be turned on overnight. You can get a cable co or DSL modem turned on fairly quickly at a lot greater speeds. Hell, you can get a cable modem for almost nothing and run 10 meg. My MPLS circuits are one and a half, three meg, eight meg, 10 meg internet, whatever, or ethernet handoff, but really, really expensive and not a lot of bandwidth and not a lot of really resiliency, yeah. So uh, what specific um, SD-WAN capable routers so the, this one here is a VeloCloud, and that's the product we represent, VeloCloud. There's Tolari, Cisco has their iWAN, Silver Peak. There's a bunch of companies out there that do SD-WAN. And really, the reason there's so many is because just like in wireless, when we started coming out with new wireless technology, you go build a, a better mousetrap and then get bought by a bigger guy. So the only real big player right now is Cisco. Tolari's, a, a, you know, they've been around a while. They were early on SD-WAN and WAN optimization. Peplink, Pep yep. Peplink Pep is absolutely, Peplink was an early multi-pathing session and thread load balancing. They don't have a cloud gateway, but they have a good SD-WAN story because it was just an evolution of their WAN optimization. It really wasn't a reinvention. It was add a buffer at the end and watch, cir watch circuits come up and down, uh, voice calls, setups, teardowns, and participate, or video streams. Part of the demo I've seen this done is with video streams. Do you have any uh, comparison? You know what, if you call, if you have a partner, I mean, we'd happily talk to you, come to our booth, we sell Velo. We did bake-offs of everybody, and we chose Velo because of the cloud gateways and the single link remediation. But Peplink's got their own sheet. They would love to tell you why they're better. Tolari would, Silver Peak would. So it's, it's more of a homework thing. We spent six months baking everybody off against everybody, and we ended up choosing Velo. And that's what this box is and what this demonstration is. Homework, homework. Yeah, absolutely. It seems like the algorithms can get really intense as to when I go on this link and mm -hmm. this link to this protocol or this level of quality over this period of time. Absolutely. And they must just 
Constantly. So we are running a version of code now on the Velo boxes that didn't early on do a good job of uh, L2TP and PPTP, VPN, because it's a firewall. That box has got firewall built into it. It's got wireless built into it. It is not an enterprise firewall. And so when I tried to put it in place and have it do L2TP tunnels, Microsoft clients, it didn't do it because the GRE one-to-one -one NAT thing wasn't working so well. So we got a new version of software. They're getting most of the bugs out now over, you know, probably the last year, year and a half. It's gotten dramatically more stable. We're no longer in the 1.0 era of SD-WAN. We're in the 3.0s, 3.1, 3.2s. But you don't really see that. I mean, everybody, you can compare and go in and throw a, a WAN emulator in with some packet loss and compare Silver Peaks to Cisco's to, to Lari's to Velo's, and they all look fairly similar. And you really don't get in there and tweak it because it's their proprietary you know, replacement algorithm that they built into their box, retransmission, multipathing, but they're all fairly similar. Yeah. So video packets are a lot bigger than mm -hmm. Video streaming, if you watch, if you were to go pull up VeloCloud right now and look up SD-WAN, their whole demo is around video. Most of what we do, we're a big telephony partner, we're a big short tail partner is around telephony, but video is a really big deal, video streaming. And again, Microsoft has their own codec, but the rest of the world is living on the codecs we've been using for years that are intolerant to loss. They don't have a lot of prediction and concealment. We used to use concealment algorithms and, and, and replacement algorithms and things like that. It's not very prevalent in today's technology, so having it built into your endpoint, that multipath is kind of the key secret to what they're trying to do, but video is absolutely anything. You can put any policy you want in there, you can encapsulate it, you can time it, you can multipath it, you can bond it. Any other questions? These are great questions. So what did SD-WAN do for me? Well, it gave me multiple cheap, fast, quick, quick to deploy internet connections. Most of my customers now add LTE bonding because for 35 bucks a month, I mean, sure, you pay for it when it's down, but it beats the heck out of being down. You can throw a little cradle point or a little ex external modem right behind your internet connection and have instant backup over a connection that you say, don't do anything but keep alive. If both of these are down, then only this traffic can go. No Microsoft update, no Netflix, but I have all of that control in my business policy. Um, again, turning on overnight or in an hour here this morning with super high speeds. Our MPLS circuits aren't that fast. And if they are that fast, they're really expensive. 150 meg internet for $49 is pretty inexpensive. Voice fix up over any and all connections or real time. I probably should say real time because it works with video too. I guess I get very focused and put my blinders on and do voice. Carrier and distance independence, low cost, active, active resiliency. Costs are cut in half. I'm putting it in faster and I'm, ha I'm half the price putting it in faster and 10 times, 100 times the bandwidth. Does that make sense? You see the value and see why this is such a big deal right now in the industry and why everybody's talking about it? So what do you think? Is it innovative? For me, to, you think about VPN, I thought that was kind of innovative because they really invented a way to encapsulate and ship. These guys didn't really, the SD-WAN world didn't really invent anything new. They just added a buffer and watched media streams based upon codecs from the 30s, 40s, and 80s. So in the innovative world, yeah, probably a little, but not like they completely invented anything new. They've just taken WAN optimization and added some buffering to it and some path steering. But is it disruptive? I think it's a little innovative, but from a disruptive standpoint? So I got a call with a Gartner guy next week because they want to have a long, lengthy discussion on, with a lot of people on why we think this is so disruptive and why it scares the heck out of the carriers. But Here's probably the best point from them in the study they're working on is by 2019, 30% of all enterprises will use SD-WAN products in their branches up from less than 1% today. That's 30% of the people who have any kind of a wide area network connection today with potentially somebody more expensive, not super fast to deploy, not a lot going on in technology, not a lot of competition, they're gonna lose a third of their revenue because they're going to go to whoever's cheapest. Cox, Medicom, Time Warner, Verizon, AT&T, CenturyLink, whoever can get me the cheapest, fastest internet as quick as possible, one, two of them. Costs go way down, resiliency goes way, way up. That's really disruptive. Yeah? Jeff, do you see this as a play for um, 
organizations that's ours going out and uh, putting these boxes in? Boxes in, and then, or do you see that also as the carriers, if they're smart, you think they get ahead of this? They all are. And, and build that into their managed service offering. Are they doing that at all? Yes, Sprint and AT and T just announced partnerships within the last month with Velo. Interestingly, they chose the one most of the, we chose and a lot of other people are choosing. CenturyLink chose a different partner, to, it's a different company to partner with. I think part of your challenge here is to provide a better service. They're going to be, you know, it, it'll get commoditized really quickly. It was a very expensive thing when it first came out and it's now not much. Um, it's a new technology, so they rent it. They don't want you to buy it. They don't like perpetual licenses, so you pay a monthly usage fee. Um, and that's part of the keep you, get you, but if you're saving a ton of money, they believe you'll do it, and a lot of people are doing it. But put it in, support it is really the differentiator. None of the carriers are real good at that. I mean, look at your carriers and go, how often do you think they're phenomenal at putting stuff in and supporting it? So if I could go with you and know your business, and I know your business very well, at the same price or even probably slightly less than CenturyLink's, and CenturyLink doesn't open tickets well with anybody else, they've got to open a ticket now with Time Warner or, or Mediacom or whatever, Cox. So it's just like putting in a router. Yep, it's like a managed router that does voice fix up and multipathing. Carriers aren't good at that, especially when it's not all their circuits. They don't want to do that. They're going to have to do it, but they don't want to. Yeah. That particular box that's sitting there, would you consider it also, you mentioned managed router. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm familiar with Peplink, but yep. I wouldn't treat that. It's more like a bonding device. It is. It's yep. not really a good firewall. Yep, it's not a good firewall. I wouldn't say that's not a good firewall either, but I think you're going to see all of the people who build those boxes or those solutions, the they'll license, they'll put them on the edge. You can put a firewall in parallel or behind it. Yep. This has to be out in front so it can see both of the internet, so it probably should be behind it and just pass stuff through it. But you're going to see these guys start licensing the checkpoints of the world because you need a real industrial grade firewall. It's a lightweight device, but it needs to have a good firewall. Cool. Yeah. Does it play well with uh, fixed wireless? Sure, absolutely, because even it actually helps fixed wireless because in some cases those are, you know, a little more depending on, you know, weather and, and the like, you can get a little more packet loss in there. But they, this works great with probably the worst thing you're going to see, which is this box right here. It doesn't get any worse than that. That's the hardest thing to run a voice connection over. Did I answer your question? I wasn't sure if you yeah, finished. Okay, okay. Any other questions? So I'm going to do a quick demo of this. I'm running out of time. It's 11.08, but I am going to take... Seems like you've been up there talking only about eight minutes. I talk fast. <laughs> and boy, I'll tell you what, when they started, they started dialing into WebExes and uh, iMeets, and now there's a quarter to a half a second of delay, because they want to do echo cancellation, <laughs> and I'm trying to participate in your conversation and interrupt you, it's really hard, because I'm like, hey, hey, oh, no, you go, no, you go, and they all back off again. So delay has its uh, place. So I'm actually going to show a live connection as soon as that pops up. As soon as it pops up, did I do start late monitoring? There we go. So any idea why the CenturyLink circuit is preferred over the Verizon circuit? Was Verizon wireless. Uh, Verizon wireless, which means what? It's cellular. 4G LTE cellular, which adds what? Latency. latency, big latency. The difference between those two circuits, this was a learning experience for me. I want to bond those. That one's 20 meg and that one's 20 meg. Can you bond them? Probably not. And the reason is, is this one's running so much slower. Imagine the packet buffer in here trying to play back. And I got 20 packets from here and I'm sending 20 out here and I'm waiting for them to come back so I can insert them to go out. This isn't a site to site. I can't bond them because the, the delays here slows this one down. I sat on the phone for about an hour with tech support trying to go, I'm bonding. And he's like, okay, well, let's get in there. And as soon as he saw this, he's like, oh, I know why you can't bond. I'm like, why? And he's like, delay. The delay on this box kills. This is faster running just on this circuit, faster than these two bonded together because of the delay is so much lower on this. But there's a live, that's just keep alive traffic. But I am going to make a phone call. into that phone, and I'll have reverb, because as soon as I answer it, it'll reverb a little bit. Test, test. In just a second, you'll see the UDP stream pop up, the blue, 
That's my live UDP stream going to that phone on the fly for my CenturyLink connection, which is this one. So I have a true internet connection with a different IP address, 72.165.237.25. My Verizon's 70, so they're completely different IP addresses. I'm gonna unplug, and I'm gonna unplug my connection and watch it shift immediately over to Verizon, test. And I'm live with a live call. I can transition back and forth. There's, in, if you're a Shortel fan, Shortel has short gear switches. And it works in a remote building over an emulated bus over IP. And we actually did tests back and forth between two internet connections. It's like running a T1 over IP. If you lost a packet, you'd have no idea where your stuff is. Where's channel three? I'm looking for channel three, it's gone. So I gotta retime and restart everything. And when that happens and that box loses its bus, the phone's connected to it restart. They don't physically restart, but they restart their logic. If they're contact center agents, they get logged out. We shifted back and forth and asked the phone system, how'd you feel? And the phone system said, that was great. I didn't feel anything from two completely different IP addresses. That's a live connection. Let me go ahead and plug that one back in. So you had that just in a fail I can't bond because, I could bond because of the delay. You, if you go to get two internet connections, if they have very similar delay characteristics, you'll be just fine. If they have dramatically different, and you're talking 15 milliseconds versus 60. So how many seconds of lost audio, and I could look at your graphs, it looked like you might Didn't do see anything. I'm gonna show you quality of experience, which is similar to Moss. Oh, you can, I, I can have people do it. You'll never even hear a clip or pop. I would just had a lot of echo, but you don't even hear a clip or pop. This is the quality of experience. So the top line, it's refreshing right now. You can see how crappy my cell modem is right now. I had a 9.94. And I shifted on the fly over to this circuit, which has a fair amount of latency. It's good in jitter and good in packet loss. This one is extremely good. And in just a little bit, that'll refresh and you'll actually see the red line where that one was disconnected. And I just I got texts and I got emails telling me one of my circuits went down. So that was live transition. Had I been talking, you would not have heard a clip or a pop. A 994 is intelligible, negligible to the human ear. Jitterbuffer, do you have to maintain to have that no gap? A quarter to a half a second is what normally is introduced to allow it to have that playback. So when you looked at those three connections and you saw that one gap, there was enough buffer to play right through that and give a MOS score of a, a 4.2. So it, it, does it add delay? You bet. Is it as much as a cell phone off of a, of a satellite? No, but it's noticeable. But if you've dialed into i or WebEx, you're getting the same thing. And they're not doing it so much for packet loss. They're doing it for echo cancellation. That's a pretty massive That's what that box is. If I were to say what that box is, it's DMVPN with a ton of buffer in it. Compared to any default settings you get on any equipment. Yeah, this guy right here's the jitter buffer is four or five packets. You go into short town and say, what's your digitor buffer? They're 10 millisecond samples, according to Cohen. And I'm going to hold three, maybe four. And at five, I'm done. Clip and pop. You start losing any of my signaling, I'm going to drop the call. Questions? With their cloud offering in the data center, the browser, the derivative, I was checking out their website. They, they, they claim that they actually have gateways in the major data centers. They do. Azure, and that's part of when I, I did my, my picture had the cloud gateways. That's what I struggle with. Yeah, it's very tainted towards Velo in that, that picture because a lot of them don't have cloud gateways. Like there's, a certain, there's certain data centers we can't get equipment in. Right, and you don't have to because you're not going to go there, you're not going to bookend it. This is only for going to the cloud, not going to your other site. No, I'm aware. Yeah, yeah. So if you're going to the cloud, you've got to go hit a cloud gateway and then jump out with their IP address. When you do a, what's my IP? You're going to go out there and you're going to appear to be them. But you get both of your connections bonded to that gateway and then out at a 40 or 100 gig connection speed. So could you do SAN replication? Absolutely. And that's how people buy that. And they want that bonded to a cloud gateway out. That's one of Velo's advantages. Is how many other ones offer it? You know, I don't know of anybody yet, but I know several are looking at it because they've lost deals over that. Some of them have lost deals because they, it really is. It's a big, big message for them. Um, Real quickly, I will show you the firewalls that I'm on. You can see the business policy, and I am out of time, but you can see in here where I start setting my multipath thing. Speed test, I'll multipath, Skype, I can name my application. So you guys can see that in a business policy world, you can dictate how traffic is treated. 
very powerful. I'm actually really, really impressed with this box. I've done a couple big installs, dropped in, people an hour later, everything's up and running and they're testing and going, oh my God, that sounds amazing, over the internet. And the internet connection is so much cheaper than my MPLS was. So that's all I had, and I'm right on time. That actually worked out better than every time I've tested. But we have a booth over here. We're in the Shortel booth. We are Shortel's only approved SD WAN partner. Come play with it, come touch it. If you want to actually log in and jump on a box and do some configuration, come see us. We're in the Shortel booth. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.